Hi folks, I'm Alan Watt and this is CuttingThroughTheMatrix.com You can also find me at alanwattsentientsentinel.eu It is September the 13th, 2007 You know that I don't plan my talks where it's on radio or the blurbs I generally come to a vague formula a few minutes before I start and let it flow from there because otherwise you become like regular broadcasters like the the planned society we live in the planned TV and radio which we hear all around us where producers and their own little research teams come up with topics to discuss We've had enough of that, I think, all of us, and that's why I try to talk as though I were talking to someone across the table. It's the only way to really communicate with people and to put out ideas. I don't give all the solutions. I put out ideas. I put out facts as we know them and allow others to come to their own conclusions because we do live in a very controlled society. Not just recently either, it's really always been that way. We have to go back through history and find out how it got to this level of control. Ancient times, two fairly modern times, relied upon religions to give and reinforce the culture. So when you have everyone doing the same rituals, giving the same catchphrases, then you feel you belong. And when you feel you belong, you are absorbed into the culture, you're absorbed by it, you feel a sense of safety or belonging. When we feel we don't belong, then it's a symptom of a sick society. The reinforcements we have don't stand up to the tests of logic, history or value. And even the ones that last a long time, like religion, change over centuries. The Christianity, for instance, in the West, as practiced today, is as vague and remote from early Christianity. As you can imagine, it's almost a different organization altogether. And it's the same with every other religion. With the advent of the 16th century, primarily we find that humankind, especially the leisured classes, began to experiment into the sciences. Courts of kings and queens paid, in fact, salaries to educated people to investigate nature. Their prime concern wasn't really because they wanted to know how flowers grew, I was to know how things worked in order to try someday to get control over other things, but primarily mankind itself. That was always the goal, because leaders in all ages have been afraid of the general public. The more extravagant their, their cuts from the general public, their salaries and their lifestyle, that the more it differentiates itself from the general population, the gap widens with riches at the top and, and more poverty at the bottom, the more nervous they become. Therefore, they put all their faith into ways of manipulating the minds of the public to control them. There are many well-known scientists who have been involved and employed by the big foundations, which really front for the elite in the investigation of the human mind and how to control it. And every facet of science has been used, every part of it. The behaviorists in psychology were heavily funded, for instance, as long as, as, as long as well as all the other groupings of psychology, the little differentiations of them. It's all because they couldn't miss anything. All data is important, and that's why knowledge is never destroyed. 
by leaders in any in any civilization. B. F. Skinner was a well known behaviorist who was allowed to do things which people within the general public could never have gotten away with. The reason for it being he was chosen to do this and backed and financed to do it and given the loopholes through the law because the ones at the top had commanded it. He even experimented with his own daughter and put her in a, a form of a cage. B.F. Skinner was a true scientist as far as science goes in that he studied all data discompassionately to find out why things happen in human life why, why nature is the way it is and mainly to find out how people will, could be predicted to behave in certain situations one of the books he wrote was called About Behaviorism and this copy is by Vintage Books which is a division of Random House I'm not sure exactly when this was published I think it was 1974 and it's full of little maxims and so on little quips that are very true but it also shows you that his mind really was set on the, the Darwinist principles as pretty well all the scientists ever since the age of Darwin have gone into they believe in survival of the fittest they don't see right or wrong because right and wrong can change with every generation if it's made to be so from the top down they understand these sciences because they've, give, they've been given side or parallel educations to the general public where they have access to data denied the general public in page 220 this little chapter is entitled Controlling Social Environment and he says people have suffered so long and so painfully from the controls imposed upon them that it is easy to understand why they so bitterly oppose any form of control a simple analysis of controlling practices such as that in the preceding chapter is likely to be attacked simply because it could be misused by controllers but in the long run any effective counter control leading to the liberation of the individual can be achieved only by explicit design and this must be based upon a scientific analysis of human behavior we must surely begin with the fact that human behavior is always controlled man is born free said Rousseau and every is everywhere in chains but no one is less free than a newborn child nor will he become free as he grows older his only hope is that he will come under the control of a natural and social environment in which he will make the most of his genetic endowment and in doing so most successfully pursue happiness so Skinner and most of them at the top in fact all of them at the top believe that genetic endowment gives you your success and intellect, uh, physical fitness all of those things will help you succeed but what they don't mention is that it will help you succeed in this system this system which is based on money which is a form of reinforcement in itself to keep going and get more that's your incentive this is uh, the Pavlovian technique that was in existence long before Pavlov therefore at the top they truly believe in eugenics they always have believed in eugenics and that's what really Darwinism is based upon the survival of the fittest and survival itself of the fittest meaning they're willing to kill others in order that they should survive themselves 
That's the bottom line. And that was shown in Arthur C. Clarke's movie, 2001, at the beginning, where the two rival tribes of apes go down to the watering hole and shake their fists at each other across the water, have a, a few jumps up and down and yell, have their drinks and then they go home, but no one is hurt. And so civilization in that movie began with one ape that we that would be called deviant because anything outside the normal group is deviant, you see. But that one ape used a, a bone, a big thigh bone, as a weapon and went across and killed the leader of the other tribe. So the first murder was the start of civilization and that's why they say in the higher groups and societies that civilization is brutal, which is true. Because of our conditioning and because most people are absorbed into what they think is a natural culture that's evolved, they will tend to be upset when someone points out little items within that culture which upset them um, or make them nervous, really. They make them nervous because it brings them close to a thought they might not want to have. You see, these scientists are not all wrong. They have observed cultures for many, many centuries. They've studied the human behavior of male and female and every age group right throughout life for centuries. And they know how to formulate cultures, create them, and manipulate them, update them, just like you update and upgrade a computer program. And those who are in the program are the last to figure it out when things go wrong. The majority of the public never question what they think is their reality. They think, and they're taught to think this and reinforced again in school and education that we just evolved to this stage by chance and by the occasional martyr in history that had a good idea and gave their life to make it happen. That's a traditional story we have down through the centuries. Yet nothing is further from the truth because power has never voluntarily given itself up to another system. What it does is to give fronts of a new system but you still have the same dominant minority controlling it from behind the scenes. This is to placate the people and keep them happy. In the 1700s, the elite of Europe, the wealthy elite of Europe, had many meetings. There were, there were so many philosophers at that time giving all points of view, all sides of every story, and publishing them in books. And the elite were reading them and they thought they could make use of the science of psychology, the science of the mind, of the mass mind. And they employed many of these philosophers to do their bidding. They employed ones to become champions of a new system that would front for them, which eventually became called, or eventually was called democracy, much later on. When the public think they're free, when they think they have a voice, they're much easier to manage. Democracy itself keeps changing its form or its definition because the democracy they had in the home of democracy in England was vastly different a few hundred years ago than it is today, in appearance at least because only the nobility at that time had any say in anything. Eventually this was extended to property and landowners, and that held for a long time, up into the 1900s, when, it was, when the vote was given eventually to ordinary people who had no property and who rented and who laboured at the bottom class. Yet the elite have always governed the country 
and every other old and new country. Therefore, when people like Skinner talk, we shouldn't get our defenses up. We should try and see through the eyes of someone who is psychopathic by nature, a person who has worked with people and animals and conducted various experiments that would shock you, a person with no compassion, just a clinical interest in, into why this action causes this reaction to the victim or subject, as you would like to call it. Therefore, you must learn what they're after. You must learn how they think. You must learn what their motivations are. And you'll find by your own research, as everyone else must find by their own research and has in the past, that these people are megalomaniacs. They love power for power's sake. And that is also part of the Darwinian theory the most successful are the ones who breed the best in other words pick the right mates and have offspring and those offspring become even more elite and more power hungry the power itself can be interchanged with the survival instinct in their own religion and it is a religion because the whole Darwinist theory is based upon a belief. Theory, remember, is what the bottom people are taught, and theory means a good guess, but it's still a guess. It isn't a fact until it's proven, and by empirical testing can it be proven over and over again. Until then, it's a theory. You'll find today, for the masses, most education to do with the sciences at the low level is based all on theory. And often the theories change. Without mention, they just change overnight. And, be, and you have a new theory to replace the old one that was taught as law. And people passed and did thesis on them and they got their degrees. And they're all bogus. Now they're coming up with new theories all the time and we're supposed to adapt to them without noticing that how can one thing be taught as a gospel truth for 20, 30, 40, 50 years and suddenly another one is the gospel truth and the old one's out the window? How can you have faith in a new one? There are higher levels of science where they don't use theory. They have facts, but it's not taught to the public. So back to page 221 of the book by B.F. Skinner about behaviorism and to reiterate it's not about Rousseau man is born free is everywhere in chains but no one is less free than a newborn child nor will he become free as he grows older his only hope is that he will come under the control of a natural and social environment in which he will make the most of his genetic endowment and in doing so most successfully pursue happiness. His family and his peers are part of that environment, and he will benefit if they behave in ethical ways. Education is another part of that environment, and he will acquire the most effective repertoire if his teachers recognize their role for what it is, rather than assume that it is to leave him free to develop himself. So he's admitting here, you see, that schooling and education is not and has not been to help develop you as an individual. It's meant to give you a repertoire, and that's the term they use in behaviorism. You'll find people who argue all the time who haven't studied anything really for themselves, but take on movements or, or join social organizations for emotive reasons only, give slogans all the time. These are repertoires. And for everything you say, they have a counter which is another slogan they've been taught. They go through repertoires, like a machine. Repertoires are the outcomes of the conditioning of problem-solving by the use of language 
and logic you're trained at school to use a certain type of logic coupled with the information that's downloaded into you and you'll come to expected conclusions the conclusion therefore which is expected is called part of a repertoire to continue his government is part of that environment and it will govern least if it minimizes its punitive measures he will produce what he and others need more effectively and least aversively if incentive conditions are such that he works carefully and industriously and is reinforced by what he does all this will be possible not because those with whom he associates possess morality and a sense of ethics or decency or compassion but because they in turn are controlled by a particular kind of social environment your social environment culture etc all that surrounds you is part of the reinforcement that he's talking about the things you take for granted most folk don't question the system in which they live it exists it must be natural everyone else accepts it as natural because they don't talk about it much they just do it they live it they don't don't ask where it came from who developed it or where it's going they simply want to get up the ladder in the system and that's called you know pursuing happiness at least to guys like Skinner because they see you as a creature like an animal and your face, your facial expressions your your gestures uh, those that show happiness those that show sadness are just expressions of another creature to the eyes or through the eyes of a psychopath who studies you like any other creature and it doesn't mean that their observations are completely wrong either that's why they can use their theories and make them fact and they work the most important contribution of a social environment a contribution wholly abandoned in the return of a thoroughgoing individualism has to do with the mediation of the future the brutal prospect of overpopulation again that's one of their big concerns at the top always has been in all ages pollution which is the big one to r- reduce the population the big stick and to bring in a new system and exhaustion of resources has given the future a new and relatively immediate significance but some concern for the future has of course long prevailed it has been said that 100 years ago there were few men alive whether utilitarians or religious people who then thought of the goodness of an act as being in the act itself or in the will that willed it all was in the consequences for their happiness tomorrow or the life hereafter both were matters of future reward you see that was used up until fairly recently m- most of the world over this work your butt off suffer here and you get a future reward very very simple you didn't have much thinking to do but goodness in the lights of which an act may be judged is one thing inducing people to be good or to act well for the sake of a future consequence is another the important thing is that institutions now listen to this institutions last longer than individuals and arrange contingencies which take a reasonably remote future into account what he's telling you in a few words is that the future is always planned and i've been saying this over and over again people who wake up in the system to the fact that it's changing and that's really what happens it's a change in their environment something that affects them personally that makes them start to question things they're prone to be misled by many who put out there deliberately to mislead you into giving you answers and you find you're simply going round in a circle with a dialectical process working in other words force counter force back and forth back and forth left wing right wing etc 
But these characters know this. They know that you think in short-term rewards. You think in a lifetime. A lifetime to you is a long time when you're a child. It seems so incredibly vast and long when you look at older people. But our lives are so short. We are short-term planners. We want to see something achieved that we start in our own lifetime. In fact, it's very difficult for us to imagine starting something and not seeing it finished in our lifetime. We're impatient. Where the institutions, that means government too, and the big foundations that are part of their big arm since the creation of what they call democracy, they think in centuries ahead, many centuries ahead, including the changes that they want to achieve, how to bring society from this kind of society, including the relationships between peoples, that's all part of societal structure, including male and female relationships, all of these and 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 parent-children relationships, how do we get them from here to here, which might be the complete opposite, and has actually been planned to be the complete opposite when they go into genetic engineering and cloning, and then you have a whole new type of, of parenthood, etc., and already parenthood is, is altered vastly, if you look at all the laws that have been passed, and the different kinds who can adopt, etc., this is all to get us in flux to change, not because they care about one group or the other group, it's because they know what their end product is to be and how do you get society to move from there in a static situation to flux and into this particular future. They do it through planning, introduction and intergenerationally. That's how it's always been done. So I'll repeat that little part again from page 222 of the book about behaviorism by Skinner. The important thing is that institutions last longer than individuals and arrange contingencies which take a reasonably remote future into account. The behavioral processes are illustrated by a person who works for a promised return, who plays a game in order to win, or who buys a lottery ticket. With their help, religious institutions make the prospect of an afterlife reinforcing and governments induce people to die patriotic deaths. We object to much of this, but the interests of institutions sometimes coincide with the interests of individuals. Governments and religions sometimes induce people to behave well with respect to each other and to act together for protection and support. Proverbs and maxims, as well as explicit codes of law, strengthen behavior, having deferred consequences. By himself, an individual can acquire very little behavior with respect to the future in his own lifetime, but as a member of a group, he profits from the social environment maintained by the group. This is a fact of the greatest importance because it leads to an answer to two basic questions. How can we call a particular instance of the control of human behavior good or bad, and who is to design and maintain controlling practices? And that, again, is why democracy is now defined as the will of the majority is taken into account, but so is the will of minority groups. There's nothing in there about the individual anymore. So democracy is always changing because that's the schedule and that's the formula and there is an eventual end to all of this the system when even the word democracy won't be necessary anymore. Therefore, to have power in the system as it stands legally today, you must belong to a minority group or to the larger group. The minority groups generally have the leaders chosen for them and they are part of the whole agenda. The leaders know where they're taking their followers. The followers generally don't. They think they're going to get some self-interest and benefits out of it and rights, but no, they're being used and the foundations generally are the employers, the front men who work on behalf of the big governmental institutions on page 223 of the same book by Skinner it's called The Evolution of a Culture the social environment I have been referring to is usually called a culture though culture is often defined in other ways as a set of customs or manners 
as a system of values and ideas, as a network of communication and so on, as a set of contingencies of reinforcement maintained by a group possibly formulated in rules or laws, it has a clear-cut physical status and continuing existence beyond the lives of members of the group, a changing pattern as practices are added, discarded, or modified, and above all, power. A culture so defined controls the behavior of the members of the group that practices it. It is not a monolithic thing, as we have no reason to explain it by appealing to a group mind, idea, or will, if there are indeed 73 elements of culture common to every human society still existing or known to history, then there must be 73 practices or kinds of practices in every set of contingencies called a culture, each of which must be explained in terms of conditions prevailing before the culture emerged as such. Why do people develop a language? Why do they practice some kind of marriage? Why do they maintain moral practices and formulate them in codes? Some answers to questions of this sort are to be found in the biological characteristics of the species, others in universal features of the environments in which the people live. The important thing about a culture so defined is that it evolves. A practice arises as a mutation It affects the chances that the group will solve its problems and if the group survives, the practice survives with it. It has been selected by its contribution to the effectiveness of those who practice it. Here is another example of that subtle process called selection. He's talking about natural selection. And it has the same familiar features. Mutations may be random. A culture need not have been designed and in its evolution does not show a purpose. The practices which compose a culture are a mixed bag and some parts may be inconsistent with others or in open conflict. Our own culture is sometimes called sick and in a sick society man will lack a sense of identity and feelings of competence. He will see the suspension of his own thought structures to enter into a more fruitful relationship with those around him as betrayal. He will approach the world of human interaction with a sense of real despair, and only when he has been through that despair and learnt to know himself will he attain as much of what is self-fulfilling as the human condition allows. Now what he's saying there is taken from even ancient Greek philosophers, because this was studied even thousands of years ago. They know the process that you will go through, you understand that, And even those who can come through that process and survive and get stronger, they try to either recruit or eliminate if they become a problem. He goes on to translate it in his own way. In translation, a Sikh society is a set of contingencies which generates disparate or conflicting behaviors suggesting more than oneself, which does not generate the strong behavior with which a feeling of competence is associated which fails to generate successful social behavior and hence leads a person to call the behavior of others betrayal, and which supplying only infrequent reinforcement generates the condition felt as despair. You see, to him, there are emotions are irrelevant. He says the condition known as despair or felt as despair. He can't feel it himself, you see. Another writer has said that our culture is in convulsions owing to its state of value contradiction, its incorporation of opposing and conflicting values. But we may say that the values here as elsewhere refer to reinforcers, and that it is the contingencies of which they are part which are opposing and conflicting. The society will be cured if it can be changed in such a way that a person is generously and consistently reinforced and therefore fulfills himself by acquiring and exhibiting the most successful behavior of which he is capable. Better ways of teaching introduced for whatever reason, possibly only because of immediate consequences for teacher or student, will make a more effective use of the human genetic endowment. Better incentive conditions, because they understand that, see, we're all trained to work for incentives, 
just like they do it with the laboratory rats and train them to pull levers and go through hoops and stuff to get a seed as a reward. We're trained the same way. And he doesn't really differentiate our behavior to the animals at all. And, and and there's a lot of truth in that too because we've all been conditioned in the system in the same way. Better incentive conditions introduced for whatever reason, possibly only in the interest of management or labor, mean more and better goods and more enjoyable working conditions. Better ways of governing introduced for whatever reason, possibly merely in the interest of governed or governor, mean less time wasted in personal defense and more time for other things. More interesting forms of art, music, and literature created for whatever reason. In other words, he's telling you that the culture industry, you see, um, it, it doesn't matter what kind or anything they give you, as long as it's for, it, it achieves its purpose and we adapt to it and copy and mimic it, you see. Created for whatever reason, possibly simply for the immediate reinforcement of those creating or enjoying them, mean fewer defections to other ways of life. In a well-known passage in The Descent of Man, Darwin wrote, Obscure as is the problem of the advance of civilization, who can at least see that the nation which produced during a lengthened period the greatest number of highly intellectual, energetic, brave, patriotic, and benevolent men would generally prevail over less favored nations. The point survives when the appeal to character is corrected by speaking of a nation which maintains a social environment in which its citizens behave in ways called intelligent, energetic, brave, patriotic, and benevolent. Darwin was speaking of the survival value of a culture. Now, if you ever wondered about the term used in all of the countries which are brought into this world structure under NAFTA, GATT, and all the rest of it, the free trade enterprise first spouted by John Dee in the 16th century at the court of Queen Elizabeth I. And why Darwin used the same term, most favored nation, the favored nations. He's talk, they're talking about the ones, the civilizations they had decided would come through and survive, and those who didn't come in would be eliminated because they were backward, arrested civilizations, primitive, etc. In other words, they'd never changed their culture, they never changed their methods of doing anything, they didn't uh, mass produce anything, they could make all their own tools and implements and survive quite happily. They're talking about the eradication of what they call inferior types, and the countries allowed in to the big free trade the galactic enterprise of the Star Trek Federation would be the survivors, the ones who were endowed genetically to survive. Therefore, little pieces, little phrases are used in these characters' books. If you understand what they mean, you'll understand an awful lot more than what they're saying. There are remarkable similarities in natural selection, operant conditioning, and the evolution of social environments. Not only do all three dispense with a prior creative design and a prior purpose, they invoke the notion of survival as a value. What is good for the species is what makes for its survival. What is good for the individual is what promotes his well-being. What is good for a culture is what permits it to solve its problems. There are, as we have seen, other kinds of values, but they eventually take second place to survival. The notion of evolution is misleading, and it misled both Herbert Spencer and Darwin when it suggests that the good represented by survival will naturally work itself out. Things go wrong under all three contingencies of selection, and they may need to be put right by explicit design. He's talking about planning the future. Now, he wasn't suggesting something because he was employed by people who already were planning it and had been before he was born. He goes on to say, Breeding practices have long represented a kind of intervention in the evolution of the species. Back to eugenics, and geneticists are now talking about changing genetic codes. And remember, too, this book was written back in the 
74, and it was not you then. They were talking about uh, changing it long, long before that. The behavior of the individual is easily changed by designing new contingencies of reinforcement. That's what George Orwell was talking about with the sheep and animal farm. An animal farm, the vast majority of the population in this new group, this revolutionary group, were sheep or sheeple, as we now call them. And every so often the pig would come out and give the slogan and they'd reply in kind that two legs bad, four legs good. And then one day the pig, when he joined the humans in a compromise, shouted, two legs good, four legs bad. And the sheep parted it anyway without noticing the difference. New cultural practices are explicitly designed in such fields as education, psychotherapy, penology, and economic incentives. The design of human behavior implies, of course, control. And possibly the question most often asked of the behaviorist is this, who is to control? The question represents the age-old mistake of looking to the individual rather than to the world in which he lives. It will not be a benevolent dictator, a compassionate therapist, a devoted teacher, or a public-spirited industrialist who will design a way of life in the interests of everyone. We must look instead at the conditions under which people govern give help, teach, and arrange incentive systems in particular ways. Now, he's talking about we. He means the behaviorists, you see, the the professionals. We must look instead at the conditions under which people govern, give help, teach, and arrange incentive systems in particular ways. In other words, we must look to the culture as a social environment where a culture evolve in which no individual will be able to accumulate vast power and use it for his own aggrandizement in ways which are harmful to others, will a culture evolve in which individuals are not so much concerned with their own actualization and fulfillment that they do not give serious attention to the future of the culture? These questions, and many others like them, are the questions to be asked rather than who will control and to what end. No one steps outside the causal stream. No one really intervenes. Mankind has slowly but erratically created environments in which people have been more effectively and no doubt enjoy the feelings which accompany successful behavior. It is a continuing process. What I'm showing here, hopefully, is that all of that which we take as normal, including the changes in our society, our lifetime, is planned that way, is planned before you were born. And the whole idea as to how do you get the the herd from, as I say, this field over to that field, which is quite a ways off. How would you get them to go through all these changes and to accept it all, every part of it, every step they take is normal with all the changes that come along with it. Then you realize we're trained by professionals make no mistake education is all about controlling the mind to creating a mass mind for the general public that's why it's a standardized education you become standardized it does not tell you to become a true individual it doesn't promote individual thinking. In fact, it disdains it. It's all groupthink, especially today, more so. Everything is groupthink, and you must go along with the group, or you'll be shunned. Again, old techniques that they used in religion and within religious societies as well. An education that was not authorized and controlled and carefully scrutinized by the top would not exist. What is good, according to those at the top, is to obey. A good society is an obedient society. This, of course, can cause conflicts down the road when the top want a different outcome within society. 
society always thinks it knows where it's going, sort of vaguely, vaguely knows where, where we're going, they think. And yet when they notice there's a conflict, um, then the elite want you to obey anyway. And when you don't obey, immediately they terrorize you or give you another fear of something coming down. It's either going to be the wrath of God or a comet, as in the old days, or it's going to be the Russians that's going to nuke you, or something like that. Something to terrify you into obedience and to stun you into not thinking, because when you're terrified of losing your life, you're not worrying about other theories or other problems of other peoples. You're thinking about immediate survival. And when you're in that that mode, you can be moved very quickly through uh, massive changes within society. We see this even with the worldwide trend right after 9-11. It didn't happen spontaneously. All the agendas, all the anti-terrorism laws had been drafted up many, many years before and signed by all the NATO countries and even countries outside of NATO. That's why they all went into action at the same time and put the same laws on the books, the identical same laws and the same formula, because it was all planned that way. Margaret Thatcher talked about it in the 1980s. The next war of the West would be with religious fundamentalists, she called them. And you can look into her histories, look into the newspaper accounts, like the Toronto Sun article, that reported her at Massey Hall saying this very thing, she said, and the the title of of her talk was The New World Order. Check into it, and you'll see that they knew what was coming down. The beauty of conspiracy, and conspiracy comes out when government, by its very nature, is secretive and causes paranoia, We also do know that they occasionally, 50 years later, tell us the truth, which should definitely make us always suspicious of of what they do. But really, 9-11 had to happen to get the agenda on on the road, basically. Had to happen. And the project for the New American Century, the club, who wrote their agenda out and what they'd like to do with the Middle East and other countries, as America was to take over or the U.S. was to take over the lead of policemen of the world from the other countries, which it already was, of course, since World War II, but officially, more officially so, they knew that uh, they needed something to kick off this agenda. They needed to win the lotto at the right time, and they published their, their agenda, and now they're simply going through with it. Because in a world society, and that's the goal of it, world society, there can be no separate, old-fashioned type religious bodies existing. I said before, look at your religions here in the West and see how incredibly different they are from a hundred years ago, two hundred years ago, five hundred and a thousand years ago, or two thousand years ago constantly changing so now they're so diluted uh, that uh, most Christians today are are really the backers they're the the cheering team for whatever government does the the tyrannical government they cheer them on and yet the founder supposedly of this religion was killed for standing up to authorities and the economic system of his day and the the legal system of his day so those countries which still are fairly traditional regardless of of how they're ruled because psychopaths as I say always end up at the top in every culture in a monetary system the fact is according to the agenda that's to be altered and this democracy, which everyone thinks they understand, but they don't, because they've never even examined the meaning of it, and the previous meanings of it. This democracy is to be used worldwide. Yet they will need a common enemy to keep man united, 
man needs an enemy to obey government, especially when they're going to be heavily taxed and regulated and so on. You need an enemy to try and justify it. Therefore, the enemy, as within the, the Soviet Union, the borders of the Soviet Union, once they'd established their position and they had no real threats, they had to find enemies within to justify all that they were doing. And that has to be done with a world culture too. Therefore, under the guise of terrorism, you're going to see it evolve into regular psychological testing, all the way down to brain chips and so on for everyone's safety. Of course, that was the goal before it all started, long before 9-11 happened. As I say, everything that happens in a major way in history and is claimed as a surprise is nonsense. You can't keep little covert plans and rebellions secret in this day and age. It's impossible. Absolutely impossible. Big think tanks, big foundations, big organizations of spies, right down to little guys that are part-timers, are employed in every single country on the planet. And you can't plan something on the scale of 9-11 and keep it secret. It's impossible. It had to happen because it was necessary to happen. And now the whole world is going into ID cards and body cavity searches and, and all this nonsense as we get trained to obey, 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 because when the greatest changes in the cultures are being forced through, they want you be, to be terrified at the same time, so you won't think about them so much, you're simply worried about your personal security and survival. Where does this leave the individual? Well, the individual is left out of this picture and this big agenda. Therefore, it's up to the individual to keep hold of the reality and find the reality for themselves that is truer to themselves because ultimately that's all you have to go on. If you can't be true to yourself, then you can't be true to anything. You'll also be in flux. And when you're in flux, you'll be in despair. If you find yourself and you fathom your way through all of this morass of deception and conditioning, there's a peace that comes with it when you start to understand it. Suddenly things make sense for the first time. Many things begin to make sense for the first time. Everything that you'd read before suddenly makes sense for the first time because you'll see it in a different light altogether. And then you must look around at the mayhem around you of all those who still think they're normal because they haven't broken out of their conditioning. And you feel very sad for them, very sorry for them as they go through the trials in a dysfunctional system. You see the squabbles and the fights uh, over money, over property, over everything. All the, the usual squabbles that you're seeing as the culture gets harder and harder to, to keep rolling along in that hamster's treadmill that's faster and faster that can't happen, it's breaking down. And society is tr still trying to go on like the previous generation did and it's not working. And it's not working as the culture industry goes into overdrive through Dr. Phil and Oprah and all the rest of it to try to formulate a new culture in your mind to accept new adaptations to the breakdown of the culture and adapt and go on into the next. Accept, accept, adapt, adapt. That's what you're being told, really. Stop having points of view. That's what you're being told. Accept these points of view. These are the healthy ones. That's what you're told. And yet, that means being untrue to yourself if you do adopt them. Those in religion will still hope and hope and hope, as always, that the evil, nasty people in the world will burn in hell forever after they're dead, because they certainly don't burn here in any way, shape or form, unless it's heartburn after a very expensive meal. We don't see any intervention of justice in this world.
therefore you must go on personal experience you must accept your own personal experiences and you rationalize them because you are the judge at the end of it all you are the judge on what is true, false, real, unreal and don't be afraid to admit that your ego was conned, you were conned by very intelligent people who created a system in a scientific manner before you were even a gleam in your father's eye don't be afraid to admit you've been had and some of you out there too don't be afraid to admit that you've been conned by the other ones out there who've led you off into incredible stories around the galaxies and back in many different forms which have wasted a few more years of your life these are intentional but very clever people do exist these sciences have been known for eons and since the at least the 1700s masses of money went into the creation of investigation on behalf of a dominant minority to learn all of these sciences to learn them in more intricate detail so they could be applied more effectively the sciences of the mind you have a mind that's an incredible gift incredible gift you're not just a machine full of responses and synapses etc there's far more to a person than that what I've been reading is Skinner and he and the other psychopaths have nothing else in them they are more machines actually than, than anybody else they don't have the normal emotions the closest thing to an emotion of Skinner and people like himself is to see the effects of some animal crying for mercy as they're bashing its head and with some motorized hammer and that's what stimulates these characters into interest which is the closest they can the closest response they can have to to anything vaguely resembling resembling human uh, these are mutants in fact that's part of their religion their theory or religion of darwinism they claim that it's the occasional mutant down through history mutated by whatever means that causes the changes without the mutants there wouldn't be changes they're talking about themselves as a psychopathic group well that's enough of this stuff for tonight from Hamish and myself in Ontario, Canada this good night to me your God or your gods go with you <laughs>